Welcome to We Belong with Eloise. I'm Eloise of Finchingfield. So a few weeks ago, I pulled out this old UFO, something that had been sitting around for a long time. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, a UFO is an unfinished object. So I have quite a lot of unfinished objects around here. And in fact, my joke is that my creative space is called Area 51 because I have more UFOs than Nevada. So I had this piece of weaving that I started in a class a million years ago. I had it on this Oseberg style loom that was made by the instructor, which is basically just a two by four with a couple of pegs in it to hold it across. So it only stood, you know, that tall, but it was on double face tablet weaving and I really enjoyed the class. But of course, when I got home, I couldn't remember how it was done. So it kind of just sat there for about 15 years. And it moved with me when I moved from one city to another. But a couple of years ago, I took it off of that loom and I wrapped up the weaving into a little bundle and I thought, I'll get to it eventually. Well, eventually finally happened a few weeks ago. I pulled it out and I put it on my loom and I said, all right, I'm gonna figure out how this is done. So I took a crack at it, did some experimentation and I finally did figure out the best way to do the weaving, which was inscription. So I started off writing my name and yeah, it looks pretty horrible. Um, then I started experimenting with the letters. This was when I restarted it. So this was from the class and that was my old name. <laughs> so this is my new name. And I did some more experiments trying to figure out how it was done. And then I did even more experiments and I came up with a much better way of weaving. And it looks much better this way. Bonus points for anybody who can tell me what this says. But now that I've kind of gotten it figured out, I want to actually make a much bigger project. So I was going through my library and I found that Catherine Weaver has a book called Double Face Inscriptions. Now I put all of her books together into one binder, so it's a nice big fat binder. But this one is Double Face Inscriptions. The letters are based on the main Psalter from 1457. Now this Psalter was one of the first books ever printed using movable type, only second to the Gutenberg Bible. It also had several other firsts in publication. It had a printed date of publication. It had a colophon, which is a maker's mark. It was printed in different fonts, in different colors, and printed with decorative initials. All of these were firsts in movable type publication. But what is a Psalter? A Psalter is used by church parishioners. The first one was created in 6th century Ireland, and it contained Bible verses, particularly Psalms, hence Psalter, Psalms, and other devotional texts that are used throughout the liturgical year. Now the liturgical year is marked by holy days and seasons. For those who are non-churchgoers, the liturgical year doesn't start on January 1st. It starts at the beginning of December with Advent. Now, Advent is the first four weeks before Christmas. Then they have Christmas tide. Now Christmas tide ends at Epiphany, which is January 6th or 12th night. And we talked about this before in a previous video, which I'll link up here. Following Epiphany is ordinary time until Lent. Now Lent, we're all pretty familiar with. This is the six weeks of, you know, giving up your favorite stuff before Easter. You know, giving up chocolate or alcohol or binge watching TV. And then there's Holy Week, which is the week just before Easter. This includes Palm Sunday, Holy Monday, Holy Tuesday, Good Friday, and then finally Easter. The week after Easter is Pentecost. So all of these holy days have occurred between the beginning of December and the middle of April. And then it's ordinary time from the middle of April all the way through to the end of November. Now all of these seasons have traditional scriptures and celebrations and readings, particular hymns that go along with them throughout the entire year. And the wealthy literate parishioners like to have a little guidebook to follow along while they go through the liturgical year. They often also include daily devotional readings so that you could continue your pious work at home. Bonus, they were small travel size and could be tucked into your belt or into a pouch. And they called these girdle books. It's taken on a whole new meaning since then. Often these books were ornately decorated like the Lutral Psalter, which depicts ordinary life, daily tasks and chores, battle scenes, some common fashions, or some really uncommon fashions. It also included some rather amusing or even rather terrifying marginalia. Other famous Psalters and books of ours include the Duke de Berry, the Utrecht Psalter, the St. Albans, and there are dozens more. There are so many out there. You can just Google the images or go on Pinterest and you can see all the really, really ornately painted and decorated books of ours. They're just amazing. 
So there's several inscription bands that are found between the 9th century and you know, the 14th or 15th century. And interestingly, most of them are liturgical garments. So they're garments that are worn by priests or bishops. The Poor Clares Convent in Nuremberg recorded several different tablet weaving alphabets that you could use that date to 1424, 1425. And author Nancy Spies has a book called Anna Newper's Model Book, Early 16th Century Patterns for Weaving Brocaded Bands. And it has a number of extant examples in it. So here's a few that I was able to find. These include Wittger's Belt, which is at the St. Afra Cathedral in Augsburg, Germany. And it reads, Queen Emma, shining and most pious, gave this belt to Wittgar, a man filled with the Holy Spirit. So yeah, Queen Emma was a tablet weaver. That's pretty awesome. Emma of Altdorf, who was born in 803 and died in 876, was queen consort of East Francia, married to King Louis the German. So she wove this piece to the future Bishop of Augsburg. So we have a really good approximation of when she wove this, which was 858 to 860. The second piece is known as the Ale Bakunda, or the Augsburg Belt. This is also a 9th century piece that was woven in red and kind of a green-yellow silk. Now it's in a couple of different pieces, so we don't have the full inscription, but it does say, in the name of our Lord, Eil Bakunda, and then it's kind of broken, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's at the Diözesan Museum in Speyer, Germany. I have a catalog number, but I wasn't able to find a picture. Also from the grave of a bishop in Speyer, Germany, a 9th or 10th century band was made from nearly a hundred tablets. And it reads, Blessing, just as Isaac blessed Jacob with his own hand, his heavenly protector to watch over you. And finally, I found an Austrian miter, which is the pointy hat that the bishops and some abbots wear. And it's located in the New York Metropolitan Museum of Art. And the tails have a Latin inscription. The Latin inscription reads, Previa stella maris lapsis via iuri vocaris. And that's just the first part. There's several more pieces that go up and down the, the whole edges of this thing. So today I'm going to warp up the loom and I'm going to start an inscription using Catherine Weaver's book and using the font that she has created. And I'm going to do something really fun from Canterbury Tales. Now, the Canterbury Tales were written in 1392 and this font was used in 1450. So it's a few decades off, but pretty close. And I found something that really speaks to me, so I'm going to weave that into the band. Using Catherine's pattern, it requires a minimum of 40 cards. Now, if you want to do any kind of borders on it, anything fancy, you're going to need even more cards. So I'm trying the 8 over 2, which is a little bit finer. It's about half as thick, actually. In fact, I did a side-by-side, -side, I'll show that here, um, of the yarns to kind of give you a size perspective of how much thicker the yarn is. So I'm hoping that I can fit 50 cards onto this loom. I'm using two colors. You could use a third color for a border if you like. So grab at least 40 cards and your loom and a whole lot of yarn. I'm actually going to try a continuous warp and see if that works. So we're going to try a few experiments today. This is going to be fun. So grab your loom, grab your yarn. Let's, let's get started. I've got all my materials pulled together. I've got the scissors. I've got 44 cards. Got the loom with the tension peg in the beginning position, and I've got four spools. This yarn is the stuff that I pulled off of these spools using my knitting ball winder. And uh, it's a center pull skein, so I've just kind of wedged them both here into this little bread basket, and we'll be able to pull directly from them without having them roll all over the floor. It's always a good thing. I don't have cats, but if you do, this could be a problem. What I'm going to try to do today is speed warp these. I haven't tried this before with an Inca loom, so this could be interesting, and I certainly haven't tried it with 40 cards at a time. So I'm going to use two cards for the border on each side, or left and right side, and then the 40 cards in the middle. I'm going to try to speed warp them. We'll see how far I get, because if it gets really maddening, I may just abandon that idea and go with singles. But I've got a couple of ideas of how this might work. First, I'm going to show you the pattern. It is super, super simple to warp this up. And that's why we can do the speed warping, is the first two cards are going to be solid blue. And then the next 40 cards are going to be 
two yellow, and two blue. And then the last two cards will be two blue again for the border. So we're going to warp all of the cards exactly the same, except for the border cards. And then we can just wrap them on, drop a card, wrap them on, drop a card. And I'll show you how that works once we get started. So first thing I'm going to do is put the yarn on the floor. So the first two cards I'm going to do like I normally do. I can't speed warp those because I don't have enough spools. You need to have one spool for every hole that you're threading. That totally makes sense. And I don't remember how long I wanted this to be. I think not quite the full length, so I'm going to skip a couple of pegs. And I'm pretty sure these are sharper scissors. They sound sharper. Oh, yeah. Okay. And the next two. So I'm making a belt for myself, as I mentioned before, and it's going to have the words written on it from the Canterbury Tales, which is a book that I I remember I read it when I was in college a billion years ago. Now because um, these are all for blue, I don't have to worry about you know which hole to put which color in, and uh, the cards are going to be flip flopped S to Z, S to Z, and it's really not going to matter. Um, the S to Z, S and Z is going to be important. But, um, well, we'll get to that in a second. So, <laughs> sorry, I'm just kind of babbling right now. I really should be drinking iced tea, I suppose. It's too hot for hot tea. That's not something I ever say. Okay, so card number two. Same thing as before, following the same path. All the way to the beginning, snip threads. My neighbors are having fun outside. You wouldn't believe it's Monday. Okay, card number two, I'm gonna warp this exactly the same way as this and we'll flip the cards at the end so that they're S and Z the way we need them to be. So I'm just threading these all S threaded which is going through the back side of the card if the card is facing you and the card is labeled clockwise A, B, C, D. Twice around, and then once for a surgeon's knot, and then we'll scoot all of these back. Oops, and again, I have to be really careful because there is there's a little groove on this dowel, which I'm sure somebody said, oh, that'll make it look nicer instead of being rough but the threads slip down in there and it messes up your tension. So this is, is this the Becca loom? No, this is the shack loom. So that is something to be aware of if you're thinking about getting the shack loom, which I highly recommend. It's a, it's a lovely loom. This is the one thing that I don't like about it is this beveled edge on that tension peg. The rest of the cards, except for the two border cards at the end. So I'm gonna set those aside for now, but the other 40 cards, we're going to warp up next. Now, I have lined mine up so that all the A's are in the same position. Now, you don't have to be OCD like me, but this makes me happy. So, I feel better that way. Now, in the pattern, A and B have the dark color, and C and D have the light color. So, we're just going to do it that way, because that makes my heart happy. So what we're going to do is take all of the cards, stack them up so that the holes line up, 
and you're going to feed that thread all the way through the whole stack. Okay, and we're going to take the second thread and feed them all the way through the second hole marked B. Pull through a nice long tail so it doesn't accidentally fall out. Grab your yellow threads. I'm going to feed a yellow thread through C. And a yellow thread through B. Poke that through a little further. There we go. Okay. So all of the cards are now threaded all at once. So the yellows are next to each other and the blues are next to each other. Not diagonal. They have to be next to each other. Okay. Now you take the ends and line them all up. Or you could just grab all of them and snip them to the right length, but you know, I'm frugal. So we're going to Pull them all. See, they're all through the whole stack. And we're going to tie this on. So I'm going to tie it with a surgeon's knot. And you will need to untie this later. So you don't want to tie it too tight. But I don't want this to come out while I'm pulling on the threads for the first pass. So I'm going to tie it like so. And I'm going to grab the whole stack of cards. Tighten that up a little bit. Now you're going to want to drop the first card, the one that's closest to the knot. I mean, you won't be able to pull the, the top card on this side because all of these cards are in the way. So you'll take that first card and drop it. And then you'll want to wrap it around your pegs, the whole stack of cards, all the way around. Oops, don't snag the bottom of the flume. All the way back to the beginning. See, we did a whole loop all the way around and that first card, or the first multicolor card, is on your loop. Okay, so then you want to drop a card and repeat. Drop a card, and around we go again. I'm going to shove these back. It's as simple as that. You just continue that until you run out of cards. Okay, so when you get to the last card, don't stop there. Because after that last card goes on, you have to go around one more time. Otherwise, you'll find you're a card short. So around the pegs one more time. Finish up at the end. I'm going to go around a couple of times just to have enough space here. Okay, we now have 42 cards loaded up on this loop. I'm just going to kind of scoot them up out of the way a little bit. I'm going to have to sort all these out later, but now I'm going to go back to where I tied off the beginning. So I'm going to carefully unpick that knot and then later I'll dig these out of the trench there 
and then I'm going to tie this end to this end. So it'll be one continuous loop tied by those two pieces. But first, inspect it. Uh -huh. This is where having fingernails is very useful. Picking knots out. Also having near vision is very helpful. So I can't quite see what I'm doing. Uh-oh. Here comes the bird again. Okay. So I'm going to tie the beginning to the end. So, left over right twice, and right over left once. So we've got that surgeon's knot back on there. Snip that off. And then dig those out of the trench. Okay, so I know I'm going to have some tension issues with this yellow because one thread of the yellow kind of went slack, but I think over time as I weave it'll pick up the slack and it won't even be noticeable. Still have to do the border cards. So I'm going to do these in the traditional way. Just leave a long tail at the beginning pinch it down, follow that same path. And it is completely warped. I'll have to check the timing on that, but uh, I'm thinking that was less than half an hour. I'm just going to turn all of these so that they're S-threaded to begin with because that is going to change after we get it all done. There's one more thing we gotta do, and that's flip the cards S and Z, S and Z, S and Z, all the way across. Now, the first two cards, the border cards, I'm going to flip them. Let's see, how's this one? I'm going to start with Z and then S. So the first card is Z threaded and the next one is S threaded. According to Catherine, the first pattern card is a Z threaded card. So I need to flip that first card to Z. So now it goes through the back of the card, but on the right, and then it alternates S and Z, S and Z, S and Z. And we're going to keep doing this all the way across. Now the last thing we got to do is turn all those alternate cards so that the blue is in these two positions, the A, B position. So we're going to have to turn all of those cards so that the blue is in the same position. You can see we're going to have some tension issues for the first couple of turns. And there. Shuttle time. Okay, so let's get this started and see if we can at least put this in some kind of order. So I'm going to pull the thread through, leave a nice long tail. I like to thread it so that the shuttle's on the left and the tail goes off to the right so that when I'm done with a sequence, the shuttle always ends up on the left. And then I can put a my elastic around it and hold on to it. I'm going to turn all the cards forward. And this is going to be the way I check to see if I threaded these properly. Because if the colors all come out right, and the shapes all look right, 
and we did all right. All right, now because the tension is a little wonky, this is gonna be a little bit troublesome the first couple of passes. So I am going to very carefully support it with my fingers. Whoops. All right, send the shuttle through. And then I'm going to send the tail back through. Now this is going to help anchor it. Turn all the cards forward again. Well, we've got one card snagging on another back here. Why? Oh, because there is way too much slack in this thread. I think the cards are turned wrong. So we should have the two blues closest to me. Two blues, two blues, 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 blues. Okay. Okay, so lesson learned. Need to be very, very cautious about thread tension as you warp this. I'm probably doing 40 cards for this first attempt. Might have been a little optimistic. All right, we're gonna turn the cards again. And now the blue is showing up. Use that to comb the threads. All the yellows should be at the bottom and all the blues at the top. I'm gonna pass the tail through one more time. And now tuck that out of the way. We're not gonna need that anymore. Now we're starting to take up the slack here on the bottom but I'm going to turn this a couple more times just to make sure that everybody's happy. So these first few passes are really going to be messy. And look at that, there's still all kinds of slack there. I wonder if I can find that thread and pull it. Find that individual thread. Oh, there it is. All right. Well, that, that worked. That was some unexpected magic. All right, so that's one way you could do it. After you turn it a couple of times, find the thread down here. Just give it a tug, and then you'll be able to smooth out all that slack. All right, I'm going to turn a couple more times. Oh, I've got a fuzz right there. Ah. So this is the first letter of the message that I'm going to write. I'm just going to write my name. I figured that's a good place to start. So I'm going to write my name, Eloisa Finchingfield, and then I'm going to write the Canterbury Tales message after that. This is the E, and I'm going to be turning it sideways. So we're going to start at this first row here and work our way up. But before we can start making the letter, we're going to need to have a yellow background because I'm going to have the, the lettering as blue and the background is going to be yellow. I have to weave it so that there's a few lines of yellow so that there's some contrast. You can't just start right from the blue and have it kind of bleeding into the letter. So I am going to turn forward and bring the yellow up to the surface. This is going to be a little tricky for the first few passes. Still, 
So we've got our yellow. I'm going to turn it one more time. And we still have the yellow. Now to maintain that yellow, now we're going to turn them all backwards, except for the border cards. We're going to separate those out. I'm going to turn all of the cards backwards, border cards forward. Okay, so we turned all these cards backwards, except for the border cards, which turn forwards. I'm going to make, pass it through, turn it backwards again, border cards forward. Wiggle it a little to open up that shed. It's still a little sticky. Sticky threads. Okay. Now, I think I might want to have an inch or a little bit more of this yellow before I start the, the lettering and I may trim this back or fold it over so I don't have the stripes. So I'm going to turn all the cards forward and this is how you maintain that solid background. Two turns forward and two turns backwards. Getting started with the pattern. This is the E. This is what I'm going to start weaving. I'm going to have my whole name, Eloisa Finchingfield, and then I'm going to have the Canterbury Tales quote after that. So that'll be fun. Now, if you want the rest of the alphabet, of course, you can contact, I think it's Blurb Books. I'll have the link in the description uh, for where you can order her books because they are fantastic, totally worth every penny and more. So I'm going to start here at the bottom, like all the patterns. Now each line is one pick. So you'll notice that everything is doubled. So you do two of those and then two of those and two of those and two of those. So we're going to start with lines one and two. Lines one and two, and I believe, yes, if I turn it forward, I'll get the light color. If I turn it backward, I'll get the dark color. So I need to turn the border cards forward. And the first seven cards will also go forward. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Remember the border cards are not included on this pattern, so you need to compensate for that. And then two cards backwards, three cards forwards, two cards backwards, three cards forwards, two cards backwards, and then 10 cards forward. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, then two backwards, and the rest will go forwards. Scoot those. Okay. So I'm going to turn the backwards cards backwards. I always do the backwards cards first. I'm not sure why, but it's just part of my, you know, my system. Okay, and you'll see the blue popping up to the surface now. That's exactly what we want to see. Except for those two cards look funny. Why do they look funny? Let's see. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's All right. I don't know. Weird. Okay. Turn those cards again for line two. I'll pick two. And then and shove all the cards together. Yeah, that second set looks kind of funny, and I wonder if it has something to do with the S and Z. I don't know. We'll figure it out in the end. Okay, pick three and four. Now to get the yellow color to come to the surface, we have to turn those cards backwards and turn the dark ones forwards. So the border cards will go forwards like we did before. One, two, three, four, five, six backwards. And then cards seven through 21 will go forwards. So seven, eight, 
10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, well that's not right, 31, 22, 24, 26, 28, 30, and 1, and then the border cards will go forward. And then turn all the cards. And now you'll start to see the spine of the E. And then same thing as before. That is pick four. All right, pick five and six. Oh, I should have just kept it the way it was. Oh well. Um, so five yellows will go forward this time because you'll see the yellow is nearest to you. If you want to bring it to the surface, it has to go that way. So two forward plus five forward. So that's first seven cards. Um, and then a whole bunch from backwards to card 31. So let's see, that's uh, six, six, seven, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, 30, and one. Now what would be even better is if you have your cards numbered, then you could just say, okay, cards number six through 31 need to do this, and then you can just move those cards. And it's a lot easier than counting. This is just gonna take me a while. I might give up and get out a Sharpie and mark the cards. But unfortunately these plastic cards, the Sharpie doesn't stay very well. Eh. These ones are actually engraved a little bit, so the Sharpie stays better in the grooves. But if it, you just draw on that flat plastic surface, it will wear off. Or you could just count. All right, that was pick number five. Pick number six is the same thing. I could probably beat these just a little bit harder to really narrow down that so it doesn't look so chonky. But I guess it's just going to look chonky. So this next pick, number seven and eight, there's a whole bunch that are yellow in the middle. So again, we have to be good with our counting. So we'll go backwards. And then those, yeah, those two go forwards. My brain is just kind of, okay, 7 through 23, we'll go backwards, so 7, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 23, and then two forwards, one backwards, and one, two, three, four, five forwards, and the rest backwards except that water card set. All right, let's see how this looks. Pretty exciting. And again.
Okay, this next pair has a whole bunch of dark colors again. So those first three go forwards and then a whole bunch can go back. Okay, numbers four through 24 are going backwards. So four, five, six, eight, 10, 12. 14, 16, 18, 20, 4, and then 3 goes forward, and then 1, 2, 3, 4 go backwards. It's kind of hard to count because these are so dark, and then the grid is also dark, so I'm having trouble counting them. Again, I need some readers, or a bigger copy of this pattern, I suppose that would also work. Oh, this is looking so nice already. I'm super excited about this. Turn again. So everyone is at home at the moment. We've got the uh, middle kid is still home from college. The big kid is looking for a graphic arts job. Youngest is on summer holiday, so, and of course, husband is still working. He's feeling pretty good. Okay, so the background ones go backwards. One, two, three, four, go forwards. Three, four, five, go backwards. Three, go forwards. And then numbers 15 through 27 go backwards. So 15, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, 27. Yeah. And then four forward. And the rest back except for the border cards. But what else? Let's see. My garden has been mostly a failure this summer. The only thing that's growing well out there is the potatoes and garlic. And we have some tomatoes that are looking kind of eh. But pretty much everything else killed over and died. And I planted again and it killed over and died. And a few things. I put more seeds in. And yeah, they, it's just been a bad year for gardening for me. I don't know what it is. Um, I did plant some lettuce seeds a few days ago. They've just started sprouting. So we'll see how that goes. Let's see, 13, 14 is exactly the same as the previous one, except they're gonna go the opposite direction. So those two go forward and then three backwards, and then one, two, three, four, five, six forwards, two backwards, and then three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, go forwards. So four, eight, 12, 14, and then three go backwards, yes? I hope so. And repeat. This does look a little elongated. You know what? I think I did screw that up back there. Oh well. What happens when you don't pay attention? Okay, oh, this is the last pairing. So, we got two, and those two go backwards and two forwards. 
and then cards number so it will be five through 27 go backwards so five and six eight ten twelve fourteen sixteen eighteen twenty twenty two twenty four twenty six twenty seven two go forward and the rest go backwards except for the border cards and we will finish off this e It's a little stretched out because of my goof in the middle, but I think overall that looks pretty cool. I'm going to, just to finish this up, I'm going to go a couple more spaces. So there's a space between this letter and the next letter. Queen Emma would be proud. <laughs>